along, but there are several features that are available in NQE that I don't have in the other products. I also have licensing issues. It's easier for me to get an NQE license than it is to get an LSF license, for example. My personal opinion is I still like NQE of all of them. LSF is good at taking a bunch of workstations and treating them as a compute server cluster. In other words, LSF is good at pushing work out to your small workstations. And PBS is good because up till now it's been free. Now this summer they split PBS into a free version and a licensed version that you have to pay for and everything. And the licensing is about the same as the other two products. So people are still using PBS open source version, but then they don't get some of the iris features, for example. So that's the reason I'm sticking with MQE right now. So really with this class, what we're doing is taking a computer, and I'm going to give you four codes. Our job is by the end of the week to have a reliable production batch server environment. In other words, jobs aren't dying, and throughput of the system is predictable. Okay. So I'm just giving you four programs, just so that you know right now, I'm just calling you code one, code two, code three, and code four. Code one is an FFT program. Code two is a program called Ocean, for temperature modeling. It's actually been rewritten these days, it's now called POP, Parallel Ocean Program. Third one is a program called Hull, computational fluid dynamics program that models the weight behind the ship so that they can change the, the hull design to see what the weight looks like. And the fourth program is something called Thrash, which is a standard iris tool to uh, stress memory. So Thrash is a way to create big processes and stride through the data, but it doesn't have any real meaning to its output. Now in all four of these programs, I don't care about the output. In fact, the output has been turned off on them. So code two would spit out some ASCII answers. Those prints are removed. So the output, we don't care about. All we're gonna do is throw these four programs at the system and time them and see how long it takes them to get through the system. Okay. And that's one difference between us and workstation tuning. We're gonna have accounting turned on we're going to be collecting long-term data. We're going to look at a week's worth of data when we're done. We're going to have three types of accounting turned on in this class. Standard Unix accounting, something called extended accounting from Security Audit Trail, and something new in 6.5.7, 6.5.8 called CSA accounting, Comprehensive System Accounting. When I put together this class, I basically took my Unicos tuning class and I've been using these same four programs since 1984 about. Okay. So I basically took the same concept. This is kind of like on-the-job training. I'm your data center manager. I'm giving you four programs. We're going to optimize them a little bit, and we're going to throw them at the system and see how long it takes them to get through the system. And it's the accounting data that tells me how long it takes to get through the system. Now, as your data center manager, I'm telling you right now, politically, our objective for the week is to get code two elapsed time as short as possible. We want That's our objective. I don't care about code four, if it's thrashing on memory or swapping the paging to the swap device. Those are side effects. Code two is my bread and butter. That's what I make my money off of. That's the important application of the job mix. Now, it used to be when we had the share two scheduler, I would then pick out somebody in the class and say, your code two is more important than other code twos. But share two support has been dropped for a little over a year now. I can't get a license for it. There are a couple of sites running it, but I cannot get a license for it anymore. But that would have been another product that I would be introducing in this class. Also, we've got things like user limits turned on. We've got the comprehensive accounting turned on. We've got PCP turned on, all those sorts of things. Okay. So that's really the difference between this class and the advanced admin. The advanced admin is single user, single platform. You create your own load and you measure it. In this class, somebody else could be creating the load and you've got to recognize what the load problem is. 
during the week, I'm going to introduce performance events as well. So as soon as I can, I'm going to introduce CPU loads, I'm going to introduce memory loads, and I'm going to introduce I.O. loads. And when I introduce the load, there won't be anything else behind it. So when I have big CPU, there's no I.O. behind it. When I have big I.O., there's no CPU behind it. Okay. And that's why I actually removed the, the output from code 2 and code 4 have no output to them because I want them just to be the CPU and just to be the memory part of the work. Otherwise, if they print an answer, I then have to time the I.O. wait time and I'm trying to eliminate that from the uh, data so that I only see one source being stressed at a time. Okay. I guess now is a good time as anybody any to assign account IDs. And I was going to assign you TG01 on do. I don't care what you use in the classroom or in the Cray Park, just on do, which is the machine that is our batch compute server. And then you'll be TNG02. I'm going to leave TNG03 for Gus. Warren, you'll be TNG04. And Janet, you can use five or your normal accounts since there may be things you want on do. I'm assuming your account is still valid on do, so let me know otherwise. Then on your workstations, I don't care if you log in as guest or root, there's your passwords. On do, I'm not going to give out the password right now. If we need to, I will, but when I give out root password with large classes, by the end of the week, it's in worse shape than the beginning of the week. Because <laughs> people use inst or make mistakes or try things. One person trying the same thing as somebody else at the same time would have problems. Because it's really designed for single administration, right? So I'm going to try to avoid giving root. I'm not concerned about giving it out in a small class. It's just by, by practice, I generally avoid it. And I'll be assuming the root. So in, in essence, I'll be doing the administration as a group type of activity. There really is no private labs to this class. Everything is experiencing as a group. Your private lab is to run these codes and to see what they take in timing figure out what are big CPU, what are big memory, what are big I.O., how much CPU memory and I.O. do they need. We're going to multi-thread code 2. So code 2 is my bread and butter, so we're going to use uh, the APO option on the compiler. The rule in this class is we don't go into source code. I cannot change the source code in these four programs. Compiler levels I can play with, environment variables I can play with, but I cannot change Fortran or C. So that's a different class once we get that deep. But that doesn't mean we're not going to run the applications and profile them and figure out what subroutine they spend all their time in, things like that. Okay. We're just going to stop at command line types of tools. I'm also not focusing on GUIs like the, the Pro Dev Workshop GUIs and stuff like that. Everything here is primarily command line interfaces. And for me, that's usually the way I have to operate because I'm logged in over networks. I may be logged into Singapore or England from here in Minnesota. I may be sitting at my hotel room with the 28 modem having to look at somebody's machines. So you really have to be able to look at a machine when you don't have bandwidth to run GUIs to it. save a little bit of heat. Uh, Janet in the back, I've known for a long time as well. She, she was a Cray employee with me and been in training a long time and she's going to be supporting me in picking up, probably picking up deliveries in this class. And the reason for that is my son ran away on my last trip to England. His mom enticed him to run away. He missed a week of school and I just can't travel anymore with uh, the problem that I have with a 12 year old thinking that he's 20. <laughs> So it's bad enough when they're without it, but other parents enticing them to run away, but it's, it's a custody mess. I had to tell my manager I'd have to either retire from this company or find other responsibilities. So right now I've got five years to go. I told my manager a four-year moratorium on travel right now. So everyone's going to have to travel to this location for the classes, which is actually good because this is where all my big computers are. When I go to Mountain View, I still have to log in through company networks to machines here to get to them. And uh, most people do prefer uh, having me running the class because I've been doing it for so long. Now there's a ton of work, 
ton of stuff to cover in this class. I never get through all of it. I could spend a month on what I have for the class. So there are going to be some spots that I go over real quickly. If there's something that I tell people, if I'm going too fast and there's something you missed, you slow me down by asking questions. Okay? And the question isn't uh, uh, relevant at that particular time, I may ask you to re-ask the question when we talk about a particular subject area. But ask the questions so we can sort things out. Okay? So why don't we just go around the room and start with you, Carol? Um, I work here in Egan actually, then in the Customer Support Center, then then the Customer America's till the DAW. So basically I have uh, items out there for the other classes that I can teach. Uh, this year I've gone into Linux, uh, primarily the cluster class, teaching PBS and MPI within uh, Linux cluster, 1200s or whatever get to the class. The main bullet for this class is number 18 here. What I've given you uh, is a uh, table of contents, an outline, so to speak, of what that material is like. But it's unfinished material. It's constantly being worked on. So the bullet 18 is the actual raw HTML. And there's one HTML file per chapter. And then I run it through a Pagify script that creates the, the document that I handed out earlier, which is the outline, creates page numbers, headers, footers, and all that kind of stuff out of the HTML. So there's a frame version, there's a table of contents, and then there's the slides that are going to be what I present off of. Okay. Lastly, there is a toolkit that I'm going to be using in this class of things that I've collected and some of the things that I've written. So that's available on this page as well as outside the firewall. Uh, by the way, the customer version of this class is called Pesto, and we changed the name so that people did not go to Pesto expecting me to deliver the class. So if it's OPET, up till now it's only been me and Janet will be helping out in that area. Also, bullet number 22 here, we're going to spend some time in some of the case studies that I've collected. So I've got SAR and accounting data from various types of machines, from Disney, NRL, uh, various types of high-end sites that I've been looking at. Even a week ago, I got some SAR data from an Oracle machine that had high system time, things like that. So I will be jumping off to other case studies other than do during the class. And eventually, I'm going to put all these case studies into a, uh, a case study book with documentation on the case studies. Okay, so everyone found my home page. So I'm going to go to showcase slides. And that's just going to lay out my presentation portion. I'm going to jump to the HTML as I need to to look up things, but primarily everything's going to be off of these showcase slides. And in front of you, you should have, what, two manuals? One thin one, one thick one. The thin one is what matches my slides. The thick one is what customer education has done to my class. <laughs> <laughs> now they rule by committee, so everything got shuffled around. I hand that out so that you're aware and it's got the text portion underneath the slides, but I don't like their order and they don't like mine. So we have to work around that. So that's why you have two manuals. One is matching what I do and then one is what the customers get. You can find about an 80% correlation, but they juggle things around so much. And I find it real awkward the way they do it. I had to teach it uh, two weeks ago in England for the first time off this latest version. Everything was juggled around, so that's why there's a separate manual. So the thick one is going to be backup, but it's the thin one that matches my slides. So if you're coming into this class, I hope you have some Unix background and know some basic IRIX. Uh, VI I use a lot. Again, when I'm logging into cross networks and stuff, VI is the editor of choice. Uh, basic shell operations, being able to know both Morn and C shell. Now typically people log in and use the C shell, but in the batch environment, the Morn shell is common. So the jobs that I'm going to give you for these four programs are in Morn syntax. 
terms of system administration, there's boots and shutdowns. I'm going to have to grab the operator council for due this morning, and we'll use that. It's called IrisCon. If you're not aware of this, while well, we talk about it right now, there's a new product coming out called Krell. K-R-E-L-L. -L. It's, it's basically taking the IRIS console, PCP, RoboInst, software imager, a bunch of pieces, and putting them on a 1200 running Linux. And then that Linux platform would be an operator workstation for both IRIX and Linux data centers, clusters, things like that. So Corel is kind of a web GUI on top of IrisCon and all these other pieces that we've had out for a while. And Corel is just putting our operator environment for a data center onto a Linux platform, onto a 1200. I don't know anything more about it than that, though I'm supposed to. I haven't played with it or anything. But Corel is basically a new package for this IRIS console to do loops and shutdowns, to be able to look at, you know, if I have a 50 node Linux cluster out there, to be able to look at their, their startup shutdown initialization outputs that you normally see on your workstation or something. So I'm going to be using the older IrisCon for that. Doing boots and shutdowns. Software installation has already been done. Now for your information, last week I upgraded to 6.5.10. I'm not even sure that I booted on that yet because I booted over the weekend and I had it reconfigured the kernel so it came up and said I reconfigured it but my next boot should pick up the change. So hopefully I won't have any problems with the boot. But I installed it last Thursday or Friday, and then yesterday I took the machine, booted up my root on the older kernel, but not the newer kernel. And did some tweaking already, primarily to save time and stuff. Usually when I run these classes, I grab the latest that I can. So 6.5.10 is pre-release still. It should be going to manufacturing in another week, or in the next week, I should say. So that's why I grabbed it. My last class was 6.5.9, the class before that was 6.5.8. I usually don't stay on the same release for each class. So we are going to experience problems. Generally, I have yet to have an operating system survive this class. Because <laughs> we're going to pound on everything. In fact, my last class, 6.5.9, I had to leave the machine in a hang state. It wasn't a workload problem. So don't, don't be surprised if we find problems. I'm also using a brand new NQE that MR about a week ago. And I've still got to get that NQE working. Do we buy out rights to NQE? We sold them to uh, Platform Computing, mm -hmm. and all the support and everything is moving off to them, but we still have a couple of developers that help them. Okay, so we kind of get used, we have the access to it and use of it? Yes. Yeah, we get, we get a free license on the emergency page and stuff like that. So it's easy to play with. Uh, it's easy to download and supply to a customer. But a lot of people are going away from NQE because they consider it an older product and since it's not being supported by the original vendors, it's being supported by the LSF people. LSF is more interested in getting everybody to LSF. Okay. And then most people are actually going to PBS, which is a second generation rewrite of NQE. In fact, PBS developers came to my NQE classes to get a feel for the internal NQE before they started developing PBS. So there's about an 80, 90 percent correlation comparison between the two, down to protocol handshakes and all that sort of stuff. Okay. But NQE, it's easier for me to get a license, and that's why I'm using it. It also supports something called Miser that we're going to use in this class. Okay. So, anyways, I already did the software installation. I've installed more than just the defaults. I've installed job limits. I've installed accounting. I've installed the extended audit software, SAT software. I've uh, installed uh, some GUIs for disks, XDKM, if you haven't seen that yet. And various other pieces, Miser, and some job limits, and stuff like that that I had to select, which are typical for a compute server market. There, there is a uh, install standard. I wish there was an install compute server option select all these other pieces. XLVs, for example, are not in your default list. You have to manually go in and select them. So I've already done the installation. My system has like seven roots on it. One of the roots is mine. I can do anything I want to it without messing up other people's roots. Okay. 
we're on what's called root underscore e. So, so this is the root that I did the inst on last week. And it's like a S1, D2 in terms of disk location. There may be times when I come in in the morning that it's on a different route and I'm going to have to reboot it. Okay. And I've got a little script that basically does the nvram commands to change the disk drive and the partition names and stuff to switch between the different routes that I want. So last week when I installed root E, I was actually up on root G. And when I used inst, I used the dash R option to say put it onto a different route. And then when I'm done, I can actually copy my current root's configuration stuff to the new root. So in a large data center, it's not uncommon to have a production root and a development root so that I can test and upgrade before my users actually experience it. And in fact, with something called partitioning, that's done a lot more conveniently. So I don't have to recable or anything. I can carve off a couple of CPUs, have its own root, build that root, and then test that, that operating system before I actually expose my users to it. Now, partitioning is not officially supported in the Origin 2000 product line. The software works, but there's no protection of power cycles and reboots between the partitions. So the hardware support was not there to protect the reboot from one partition hitting the other partitions. With SN1, the hardware support is there, barrier protection between the different partitions. So you can power cycle one without impacting the other. So what I'm trying to say is you can play with Origin 2000 partitioning, but don't expect fail-safe protection between the partitions. If one goes down, they all go down. But you can still play with it. You can still use the commands, just you're not isolated as, as strongly as you'd like. I'm not going to be using partitioning in this class. But it would have been useful for me to test my other route before I went to production mode. That, that's my main point. <coughs> We're really not going to do any partitioning of drives. That's something that you would have done in the advanced admin class and the basic admin classes. Also making and mounting file systems, we may be doing some stuff there. And I think I need to take a break. So in this case, I have to log into the uh, system. In this case, it's an IRIC system, I believe, that's running the IRISCon software. I was trying to log in that one, but it's exactly the same error. Yeah. This client is not trying to connect to that server. Yeah, we'll get to some of that. The goal is probably in the standard uh, uh, DNS, NIS lookup. But it's the one that has the operator software configured for it. Now it says these are the system supported. Do happens to be on it as well. So what I'm going to do is run this IC command. Okay, and that brings the GUI up for IrisCon. However, if I were logged in uh, without an uh, X window interface, like I can tell that in from my Windows laptop, I would want to log in into an ASCII interface. And then I use port 5000, and then I don't have to have X window GUI support on my system. Okay. And the same thing is true within uh, the Grell package. Now is Gull is a little like a O2 and maybe or something like that? Yeah. It's a O2 I think. Is that the one that sits is that one in the computer room over here? I don't know is where it is. It is actually downstairs. Um, I'm sorry, we are downstairs. Is uh Do you know where is the front desk where you the main entrance? Up on E or F? And F. On F, yeah, up there. Yeah, and then you see that there is a, a escalator. If you go down, there is the first door that you see. You go in, those machines are there. Yeah, that's a new computer room. Yeah. Right, yeah, exactly. Where we're all the old exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. I believe that's where Do is located too. Okay. In fact, one of my earlier classes, they moved it from the data center to F, and nobody knew where it got moved. <laughs> that was right there. The person that moved it was on vacation that week. So Gull is the operator console, and I just logged in normally, but if I'd logged into port 5000, then I would have invoked a whole different logging environment, a different password file, all that sort of stuff. And 
and I'm just going to see if IC comes up now. I had to do an Exhost Plus. In your case, this was from the Exhost command. So I had gotten a uh, X window failure because I did not have permissions. So I think on my other system here, I don't see it anymore, but I did an Exhost Plus or Exhost in the name, the host that I want to be able to open up windows. Okay. So when I got that, this is the Iris Console uh, GUI interface rather than the ASCII interface. And I click on the lakes group and then I can see all the nodes within that particular cluster. And I was wrong. It was not on that particular uh, configuration, it looks like. So I'm going to have to call the uh, Chris Duffy, the administrator, and find out where that machine is. Which one? Do. Oh, yeah, it's not there. So I'm just going to uh, ignore that right now. In my case, I'm just going to try to do it directly since it's already up. I usually prefer the operator console, but since I don't have time right now, I'll deal with that during break. And right now, when I logged in, I see that the root is on root dash, root underscore g. And that's what I was trying to reboot for, so I can get my normal root up. When you, I have a question. When you create uh, several different root partitions to boot up, do you have to change the uh, uh, variables on the Chrome, yes. you know, yes. to this root before it boots, so it will know where to look for root? It can be ran. And that's what I'm headed okay. to right now. Oh, okay. With the system live, there's an nvram command mm -hmm. or from the prom, prompt okay. when you're booting. Either place has the syntax to change these. Okay. Now, the administrative staff here in Egan have a script to make it easier. Mm. It's called set boot. Okay. So it depends, but there's usually a slash admin directory in a lot of the systems here. And then set boot is just a command that makes it easier for you. So there's what they're doing. Oh, okay. What's PG? More? All. Oh. The A list. Yeah. Oh. Even on Linux, I'm in the habit of PG so much with the page. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so all we're doing is NVRAM root specifying that, where the system partition is and where the OS load partition is. So it's just an easier way to save you typing. So I do my set boot. And then it prompted me which root do I want. I choose root E. And then it's saying set. I say yes, okay. And then it prints out what the new uh, setting is. Okay. And then I do a reboot and that'll pick it up. And the other way would have been from the operator console prompt, command prompt model. Only two variables are needed. Uh, you want to see three. that again? Three. Root system. You need to specify the root, and then they are also uh, changing okay. the system and the OS. Again, it's going to be a different root, which means a different password file. And everything should be okay. Just be aware that if we come up on different roots, they all have different password files. Generally, in compute server markets, they don't use NIS as much. The reason for that is we have different policies and different machines. So compute servers usually keep their own separate password files because only certain people can log into it. For example, do is a customer service machine and engineering doesn't have accounts on it typically. Whereas the NIS database would allow them to log into the machine, for example. That's also true in Beowulf clusters. When you get into clustering, you usually do not use NIS because then you have to go through the overhead of all that name lookup. It's usually by file for everything because it's faster. Particularly with uh, congested networks or congested NIS servers. Okay, well, I'll break away from that here, go back to 
where I was. So I was trying to apply the boot shutdown process. And as my throat started getting cracky there, the last thing I really wanted is, when I want people to come for this class, I'd like them to have some site experience. I generally don't like them to go through advanced admin and then go straight into this one. I'd like them to apply the advanced admin experience and then come back into this class. And really what I'm trying to do now is, now that you've got some background, it's the application, the, the methodologies that I'm really trying to focus on with this class. The techniques I talk about in this class do apply to Linux and other virtual memory system operating systems, Windows as well. They're all TLB virtual memory based. So the techniques are the same, but the tools and the metrics are different. Even two Unixes that are same, Unicos and Irix or Linux, the numbers are different. They're counted differently. But the technique that I'm trying to teach is the same. So I'm going to drill real tight into details in the class, but I'm going to try to back away from it and say, here's what we're trying to accomplish. And the first thing is having some experience with whatever the customer workload is. So I'm trying to really get across how do I approach a system analysis. There's two different stories here. I'm at the call center and somebody calls me and says they've got a problem. Or I am supporting a site and I already have the background of how the system is configured. Okay. So in the call center case, my first question would be is, what's your system? How many CPUs? How much memory? What operating system are you running? A basic inventory would be required. And that's what you talk about with an environment. I need to get that environment picture. Okay. Whereas if I'm supporting the same machine over and over and I work for General Motors, I already have that background and I'm simply responding proactively ahead of the problem to trends that I see. So in any system analysis, there are two key things to me, SAR and accounting. Okay. I don't care what tool you use to get to the data. I use the generic term SAR. Performance Copilot, Gross View, uh, OS View, all these other tools go to the same set of counters, same set of metrics. But I always have PAR there. I'm sorry, I always have SAR there. And because SAR is there, that's going to be my common denominator. So it's not uncommon for me to get a site that does not have PCP installed. They did not want to pay $7,000 for PCP. But they do have SAR there, and I can say check config SAR on, and then check their data. Okay. So when I use the word SAR, I don't care what tool you're using to get to the numbers. I'm just using the term SAR to describe those types of numbers. And Linux Red Hat 7.0 now has SAR standard. In 6.0 and 6.1.6.2, there were local SARs that you had to get, but now SAR is a standard Red Hat 7.0 tool. So it's the same set of metrics, however, how they're counted are different. Now, SAR is telling me how the system is behaving. Too many people read performance information from SAR data. I don't believe in that. SAR does not tell me good performance or bad performance. In fact, I think Performance Copilot is an oxymoron. There is no metric in Performance Copilot that tells me about performance. <laughs> Everything that we're talking about with SAR and PCP are typically frequency types of counters. How often did this occur? And then the system tuner takes a leap of faith from that frequency counter into the time domain and says this is what it's costing me in time. But the ultimate performance metric is what? What do we all care about? Benchmarks? No. What are we measuring in the benchmark? How long it takes to execute. Time to solution. Throughput. Okay. How long did I have to wait? That's the ultimate performance metric. How long did I wait for my solution? And uh, uh, SAR does not give you timing information. It doesn't tell you how long things took. Accounting does. Okay? So typically on your big machines, and especially with compute servers, they have accounting turned on to charge people so that they can pay for the next machine. But they're also using the accounting data for, for performance evaluation reasons. So I can say and look at a machine for a month and say, during the last month, 80% of my jobs were under eight hours. 
10% of the jobs were under 24 hours and 10% of the jobs were a week long. I can't get that from SAR data. I can't from accounting data. So for me, this is left hand, right hand. I need both pieces. And if I don't have accounting data, I have to make some assumptions. I'm taking a leap of faith from one domain to the other and saying, if SAR is showing me this, then it's probably meaning that I've got some problem in the CPU memory or I.O. areas. But you don't know for sure. For example, you had a very good example this morning. My machine is slow. What does that mean? Usually, that is my least favorite performance metric, which is time to carriage returns to get my prompt back. How many carriage returns can I hit before I get my prompt back? What are they testing? They're testing the responsiveness of the shell in the interactive environment. Meanwhile, another application may be getting very, very good use of the origin, and it's drowning and marooning the interactive user out. Okay, so your subjective evaluation machine is slow. One thing may be very slow, and another thing may be very good, and SAR would not show you this. Accounting would. Okay. So if it's there, I use it. Now mail servers, database servers, even web servers usually do not have the data there. And then you have to simply make assumptions. In those scenarios, you usually only have one thing running and one user, the web server or the database server. In a compute server market, you've got multi-users that are competing. So again, in the SGI world, I've got one thing running, it's easy to identify and drill and look at that particular program. But if I'm at a university site with 50 different users doing 50 different things, I have to sort the politics out. And SAR, again, will not tell me about politics. It won't tell me who's getting good and who's getting bad. So system tuning is really looking at balancing these trade-offs between the interactive and the bash, for example. I can tune and make the interactive better, but my batch might get worse, and vice versa. Let me give you an example. Somebody called up and said their machine was slow. What they were timing was how long an LS took while a database engine was creating the meta index. Now, which is more important, me doing an LS or the database doing what it has to do? They wanted LS to go faster, but that would cause the database engine to go slower. They have to make a trade-off. They have to decide which is more important. And again, SAR would not get you past that in accounting with. So for me, SAR and accounting are left hand, right hand. I use SAR to tell me what to look for. SAR tells me how busy things are. And then I can go to the accounting data to say, how long did I wait for that busy resource? Okay. So once I've got that information, I've then got to decide what performance metric matters to me. And I've already told you for this class, our performance metric that is politically correct is code 2's elapsed time or wall clock time. In other words, the time to solution for code 2 to be as short as possible and repeatable. The record, by the way, is 166 seconds, but that was not repeatable. Repeatable has basically been under 200 seconds of elapsed time, and that was multi-threading it. So that's our that's our goal, our target. If we can get by the end of the week code two running repeatedly under 200 seconds, we'll be happy. And that means not spending money on hardware like upgrading to uh, faster clocks and stuff like that. If I go to an O3 K, I can get under 200 just by the clock speedos and stuff and the larger secondary caches. But we're working with a different machine that's, that's our baseline. Okay, so that's my performance metric for this week. Is we're gonna, the other things are simply noise to interfere with code two to create other load problems. The code two is pure CPU work. No memory load behind it, no IO load behind it. It's pure CPU. Worst case scenario for code two is two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. Same computation. I can get it anywhere from 100 seconds to two weeks. Same program. Okay. 
So that's our range. And again, I ran these same quotes on the praise for years. They were simply given to me by benchmarking back in 84, 85, the same. Here's a good mix because one is CPU, one is memory, and one is sequential I.O. and one is random I.O. So they each have their own attributes or characteristics. Okay. So if I want to pound on just CPU, I run off a bunch of code twos. There's no memory behind it, there's no I.O. behind it. If I want to pound on memory, I run code fours. There's no CPU behind it, there's no I.O. behind it. And one and three are I.O. bound. Okay, the things are I.O. In this particular case, it's an out-of-course solver. And I'll talk about out-of-course solvers, but particularly with large data sets, we know that the data is going to be larger than our physical memory, so we bring the data in in pieces. And out-of-course solvers like Nastran, mm -hmm. Nastran, they're used at uh, car companies to vibrate the doors for noise control and stuff. That's an example of an out-of-course solver. Okay. So the FFT itself isn't but the process of getting the data in and out of the FFT algorithm is the I.O. portion of it. Okay. There are a lot of other performance metrics of interest. For example, number of car crashes per day. I would hate to tune a system and have interactive get better and less car crashes per day. Okay. We'll talk about a lot of metrics in this class. There's a ton of metrics. I don't expect anybody to know all of them but I'll show you how to look them up and figure out what metrics matter to you. Then we've got to identify what's my objective. So I figure out, well, what do I got? What's the machine behaving like? And what are the politics? And what do I care about? If somebody calls up and says the machine's slow, I have to turn that from something subjective into something I can measure. And I have to figure out, OK, interactive is slow, or is it code 2 that's slow? I get sites that say, my program runs once, it takes an hour, I run it again, it takes two weeks. That's a performance issue as well in a performance metric. If I'm paying for it, you know, I would hate to have a 200 second job cost me two weeks of CPU time. And I'll tell you right now, the problem there is something called barrier synchronization. One multi-threaded task talking to another thread saying, are you done with your work yet? And I can get code 2 to set their thrashing for two weeks saying, are you done, are you done, are you done, are you done, and never get any work done. Basically playing phone tag. Interactive response is great. Meanwhile, this batch application that's multi-threaded is really, really bad. And that's why you've got to sort out the politics and what's important. And identify my objective. So my objective this week is to get code 2's wall clock time as short as possible repeatedly at whatever expense to the interactive environment. Okay. Now, once I've identified my objectives and solutions, I recommend you tune in a particular order. I recommend you look at your problems and basically go through all your resources in a particular order. And just to reiterate what's on the slides, <coughs> I'm going to fix the application first. Always fix the application first. I got a call a week ago. There's an Oracle machine out there that's got 80% system time. I looked at the system time with PAR and identified it was semaphore operations that were being failed. Okay, so Oracle is sitting there asking for semaphores. IPCS, go ahead on your workstation, type in IPCS A. And that shows your semaphores, your messages, and your shared memory. IP? IPCS, Interprocess Communication Status. Okay. Now, at this particular site, with 80% system time and all of it being semaphore operations denied, my first question to them was, what is your IPCS-A look like? Now there should be a field there that has an attached to it. Number of attached processes. Let me just go back to my system here. And there's a field in here called an attach. So I wanted them to give me a uh, IPCS listing with an attach saying how many processes are attached to that resource. In this case, we have a process attached to each one of the resources that I have allocated on my system. 
Now going back to this case study, if my semaphore is here, I've got one that's attached, but if I had some that were zero attached, maybe for example something did not release the semaphores, I have several options. I can either increase the system configuration a lot more semaphores, or I can remove the unattached shared memory segments or unattached semaphore messages in this case. I would not want to up the system limit if they were all unattached. Uh, I can't really see it here. This is the number of semaphores, actually. What this semaphore is? It's a way to communicate. They're, a semaphore is a flag. It's a synchronization flag. Okay, so standard Unix has had inter-process communication, and there are three resources. There are semaphores or a flag, so I can set a flag and somebody else can check it. Or I can use shared memory to pass information between programs, or short messages as well. So it's a way without multitasking, before multi-threading multi occurred, it's a way of communicating between programs. Now, just going back to my example, fix the application first. If the application isn't freeing up the semaphores, upping the number of semaphores on the system simply allows the application to be more abusive. It's not going to solve my problem. So I've got to go back to the application to find out why is it not releasing the messages. For example, if I took a system interruption, it's up to the program to release these resources. If I got killed before I could release them, then I would have all these resources that are not assigned to anybody but still allocated. And then when I ask for semaphores, and say all your semaphores are occupied. And there's a system parameter that says how many semaphores you have. So if IPCS shows that they're all attached, that they're all being used, then I can't fix it at the application level, then I may be changing the system side of it. But my main point is, is always go back to the application first. Don't detune a system for a bad application. Identify what's going into the application first. So a lot of the techniques we're talking about for the next two days are identifying the applications and what they're doing and profiling them. And then Thursday and Friday we get into what are the solutions for it. Okay. So I was just trying to say fix your application first. The second thing then is file system issues. Now most people skip over this because it's painful and a lot of work to dump a file system and completely redesign it and rebuild it. But it's usually your biggest, least expensive solution. Most of the markets that I'm seeing these days are I.O. bound. Mail servers, news servers, file servers, web servers, database servers, these are I.O. markets. In a majority of the markets, the file system issues are where they've got most of their problems. <coughs> For example, overuse of RAID 5 on home directories and stuff like that. Uh, Disney has this problem, or had the last time I was there. Ten different users, all on the same home file system, all on a RAID 5. And that RAID 5 was running 98% full. Now, they would have been better off going to RAID 01 and increasing the amount of disk space they had, but that costs money. Now, disk drives are cheaper than they used to be, and in Disney's case, they paid $7,000 for us to come out and evaluate their system and give them a professional services report. And the solution to that report was add more disks, which I had told them a year before when I visited the site on vacation. And my point being is that spending the money on the hardware solution might be cheaper than identifying, having somebody come in and identify the problem. And most of these markets are abusive in their file systems. They're running them full, they're overstriping, they're overusing RAID 5. Why? To save money. Tuning is a trade-off between price, performance, and reliability. Okay? And they're making the trade-off to save money and be reliable and they're losing performance. That doesn't say RAID 5 is bad. RAID 5 has its place. But it also has, for example, home directories. It's not going to be the best place to put it. I think worse that would be an NFS method. <laughs> well, that's what they were doing. Oh, NFS over the plus uh -huh. RAID 5 and everything So they else. had an NFS server, and the home file system was everybody in one file system. The 
bigger the resource, the more I can abuse it. Okay. So everybody put in one file system, all it takes is one person to abuse that file system and everybody feels the impact in their data center. And everybody gets the slowdown. Now in my office here, I have two other people in my home directory. I see the other one, I can see two other people. But I don't have the entire complex, the entire building in my one home directory. So at Disney, one person uh, does a video file out of their home directory, and this is going to also back up other resources too, as memory and buffer cache and things like that get busy handling this. So in solving my problems, I always like to look at the file system first. The majority of the interactive response problems either fall to file systems or what's called file system buffer cache. Also, most of the markers are I.O. bound. I cannot deal with the CPU issues until I get the things tied up to the CPU. If they're waiting on I.O., CPU scheduling and CPU issues are irrelevant. I always get a kick out of the person that has poor response on their systems and they try NICE. NICE only helps you get a CPU. It does not help you get network bandwidth. It doesn't help you get uh, memory. It doesn't help you get file system buffer cache. NICE only helps you get the CPU. And in most cases, we're not in a CPU-bound environment for the interactive user. The interactive user doesn't need more than a half a second. And when I talk interactive user, I mean standard Unix interactive users, not an interactive user crashing cars or something. Okay. So I always like to take care of my file systems first. Then I like to take care of my CPU issues. And that's going to involve things like Miser. We've got scheduling, we've got real time, and we've got something called miser. And also something called CPU sets. After I take care of the CPU issues, then I like to take care of what's called file system buffer cache. File system buffer cache is one of the more commonly oversubscribed resources these days. How many people have printed from Netscape and watched their system lock up for a few seconds? That's usually the fact that that PostScript file is now plugging your file system buffer cache and the interactive user cannot get a buffer. Now for people that are not familiar with this resource, there's a parameter called nbuff that says how much I have how many buffers I can hold in my buffer cache. How do you get that parameter? Or? We'll, we'll take a look at it, and I'm going to show you right now. I'm just kind of giving an overview today, but the command that really matters to you is called buff view. If you learn anything from this class, I hope it's buff view. Okay. Ten years ago, I used to have to dump a buffer header chain, take the stack of paper home, and with a pencil, go through the buffer header chain to say what was taking all my buffers. Because this buffer cache was giving me 20 minute waits on a man page. You ever see VI, and then it takes a while to pop up, and you don't even see the file name yet, and then the name comes up, and a little bit later, then the data comes up? That's usually VI struggling to get buffers from buffer cache. And this is a often forgotten resource. So with buff view, I can look at it. And to answer your question, this is my workstation right now has 919 buffers on it. So that's what nbuff is set on this particular system. That's my workstation. And then it shows I got 453 being used by metadata or inodes and directory information. I got 464 being used by my file, my data. That's all these file names here. Libraries, Netscape, executables. Those are all the things that are sitting in my buffer cache. I've got two that are empty. So I'm running out of buffers. Now that doesn't mean I can't get buffers from data or from sys. But it's just saying, of my 919, they're all allocated right now. And if somebody asks for buffers, something here is going to have to get squeezed out and go away. It, it, it does sometimes, like, when you I don't know, but I can see on my workstation sometimes escape for them all the time and disappear, yeah. you know? It could be that the reason? No. Probably, no? no, you won't get core dumps from this. Oh, okay. It's just a slow performance. 
net, get slow. Nets, yeah, it'll get interactively slow in particular. Okay. So when I'm using VI and I try to open it and it takes a long time, or you're logging into the machine and it, you know, message of the day comes out okay. real slow. All right. And I'm not, I hate to characterize and say every situation, but file system buffer cache is the more common resource that is causing slowdowns in systems these days. I, and when you get a 20 minute wait on a man page, it's probably not CPU bound, because you can get a CPU a second here and there real quickly, but it may take you 20 minutes to get a buffer. So again, we're going to come back to all of this, so I'm just kind of giving you the overview. BuffView is an extremely useful tool. Now what's most important about BuffView is if I see the, the stuff toggle in the list, Right now, these buffers are not busy. There's no contention for the buffers. It's a quiet system. But if I start seeing buff view shift what's in the list, I may have two files that are thrashing on the list. That's what you really want to watch for. Okay. Meaning that maybe there's 30 buffers here for this file, and then somebody else comes along and needs 50 buffers, so that one gets squeezed down, and then the other file goes to the top of the list. So it's, the, it's as this thing is shaking or shifting positions in the list, that's telling you that you've got a lot of issues going on with buffer cache. I pull one file into the cache, then I try to pull another file in, but there's not enough room, so I have to squeeze something out and bring in the new one. Okay. Which, which of those things do you need to look like in the file system? When you have, you know, prefer We're going to look at SAR-D data and stuff like that in the okay. file system. But file systems are the most complicated, so there's going to be PAR, there's going to be SAR-D, and a couple other pieces to look at file systems. Okay. And you're right, I, I kind of skimmed over that. But most people know about file systems. I'm trying to stress the importance of this particular resource. Because most people just put it in the disk path, and it's a separate resource. I can do direct I.O. and bypass this, or I can go through buffer cache. And they have their advantages and disadvantages. Anyway, after file system buffer cache, then I worry about memory. Let me tell you right now, you can save a whole week. <clears throat> the way you tune iRigs is to not oversubscribe it. In other words, you don't want to have swapping going on to just swap partitions. You do not want more programs than you have CPUs. And you don't want more buffers needed than you have configured on the system. iRigs is not designed to be overcommitted. That's the way you tune. Add more hardware if you have to. Redu reduce load levels. So if I'm tuning, my next step, by the way, would then be my batch load levels, my batch limits. To say, okay, our system is efficiently operating at all these points, but I've got too many things trying to use it. So I'm going to throttle back and say, I can't crash 10 cars at a time because now I start swapping. But if I crash eight cars at a time, there's enough memory there. So you're adjusting the loads on the system and throttling the system back so it doesn't spend all this time, time, time trying to figure out what do I do next. And lastly then is reset your expectations. <laughs> or finally buy hardware. I had a case where the customer didn't know the application they looked at the data, said we're swapping like crazy, so they bought more memory. It was an Oracle site. They then identified somebody had oversized a table with an Oracle, rebuilt it, and the size of Oracle doubled. And that's why they were out of uh, memory and were swapping. So then they reset Oracle back, weren't swapping anymore, but now they had all this memory that they bought. Because they did it in the wrong order. Okay. So I'm just trying to give you a suggestion that avoids the stuff coming back at you is a problem later. Now, by resetting expectations, to me, this is a traditional Cray problem. When I go to Cray markets, it was not uncommon for them to have oversubscribed machines where memory demand was 20 times the physical memory on the system. You do not want to run IRIX that way. Unicos was designed to be overcommitted, oversubscribed. IRIX is not. IRIX is designed for an interactive workstation environment. It's been put into the performance, high performance computing market 
but it really does not have schedulers, it has managers. If I run out of memory, I don't decide who do I steal from, I just start taking pages. I don't have the politics sorted out with managers. Okay. So I've had many cases where the customer simply has to say, you do not run this as a cray, you don't want to oversubscribe it. All cash-based machines have the cash thrash problems that we're going to talk about. And once you oversubscribe it like you did on a cray, you then start thrashing on secondary cash. And crays do not have secondary caches, at least the vector machines. In the uh, T3E machine, the cache was so small, it didn't matter. 64K byte is not as much as an 8 megabyte secondary cache. 